Hello dear students and welcome to this new series on modern Indian history. Guys, as you all know, history is a very very crucial component when it comes to civil services exam preparation. And within history, UPSC is especially focused on modern Indian history, especially the freedom struggle part of it. And therefore, as aspirants, it is imperative, it is compulsory on us to prepare this particular section thoroughly well. If you look up the syllabus or previous year's questions of civil services exam, you will very well understand the importance UPSC attaches to this particular component. But very often what happens is, a lot of aspirants either take this component for granted, that is they know and understand it very well, or they for somehow develop mental blocks regarding this subject and do not give it the due attention that it merits. This becomes suicidal in the exam hall. As you can see from PYQs, every year about 10 to 12 questions on an average are asked from modern India alone. And this is a very substantial chunk guys. If prepared well, almost all of these questions are gettable for you. So if you miss out on even one question, it's a very dear loss because your competitors are not going to miss out on that. The same is with mains as well. In mains, general studies paper one will ask you almost 100 marks worth of questions on history. And a substantial chunk within that will deal with modern Indian history. If you are not thoroughly prepared, then these easily gettable questions will not be sufficiently handled by you leading to loss of marks and loss of edge to your competition. This should be avoided at all costs. And therefore, I, Jawad Kazi, am starting this new series on modern Indian history from today. This series, guys, is going to be based on the textbook that Study IQ IAS has published titled Modern Indian History. I will be taking up topics from this particular textbook and discussing them threadbare with you so that we can give shape to your modern Indian history preparation. Now you may wonder why should we refer to this particular textbook? In my view guys, if you were to ask me, I will say that this is the best textbook available in the market for preparing modern Indian history. It is my considered view guys. Why do I say so? There are multiple reasons for this. This textbook covers your entire syllabus. Very often the resources that you use, these academic textbooks or for that matter, various different types of quotes, they often neglect the part before revolt of 1857. But if you see the trend of questions over recent years, UPSC is known to ask fair amount of questions from the period before 1857, before the revolt of 1857. Okay. And unless we have an understanding of that particular period, we cannot build the understanding of subsequent parts. Please remember guys, history is a story of change and continuity. So it's a flow and a flow cannot be abruptly understood from a random point. It has to be understood from the preceding eras. And therefore, it's very crucial that you have a complete understanding of the flow of modern Indian history. And this textbook precisely provides you that. And it does it in a manner that is concise as well as easy to understand. Unlike academic textbooks, which are jargon heavy, which indulge in a lot of confusing academic debates, this textbook is basically designed for people like you who are aspirants, aspirants who may not have had a touch of history for a very long period of time. By providing you content that is apt and relevant in concise and precise manner, your task for preparation of history becomes much more easier. It gives you a lot more confidence and a sense of accomplishment of having completed this topic thoroughly. So it's very crucial guys that you use this particular textbook for modern India preparation. You know, while it is concise and easy to understand, it does not in any way in any way, let me tell you, compromise on quality when it comes to preparation for civil services exam. It sufficiently covers all the relevant information and facts that are required for prelims preparation. And you can yourself check 
Use the previous year's questions to see whether they have been covered in this textbook or no. You will find that all the previous year's questions, their factual details find a reflection in this textbook. All the important facts have been sufficiently highlighted and made prominent enough in the textbook so that you will not miss them. Boxes like did you know, you know, boxes for revision, all of these make it very easy for you to thoroughly prepare the facts that are relevant for prelim stage of this exam. While prelims is very well taken care of, mains is also not as if it is untouched. In main stage also, this book will be immensely relevant for you as it sufficiently covers the analytical part that is required for writing good answers. So this is a textbook that is a complete package for you when it comes to preparing both prelims as well as mains stage of this exam. The book is extremely reader friendly as it not only covers topics from a linear perspective that is time dimension, it also covers topics from thematic perspective. Themes such as role of women in freedom struggle, press, civil services, police, evolution of administration, judiciary, so on and so forth have all been amply covered in this textbook. So it is a thematic based textbook as well. Furthermore, the usage of headings, subheadings, boxes, timelines, making of keywords, uh, you know, stand out. All of this makes your task of reading this textbook extremely easy. And when you come back to this textbook for revision, your task of revision is also eased because the way the textbook has been presented. All in all, in my view, this is a one stop solution for this examination phase. And therefore, I very strongly recommend that you order this textbook for you. It is available in all prominent stores across the country as well, as, well as online from Flipkart or Amazon. You can order this textbook. I will give the link in the description box below as well. Okay. So let us get started with today's discussion. Today we are going to take up the first topic from the textbook, which is the decline of Mughals. Now the great Mughal empire finally will unravel itself in the 18th century. Let us have a look, a quick look at the map of Mughal empire at its peak. Here on the screen, you can see the map of Mughal empire. The green shaded area is the period where the Mughals ruled till 1605, that is when Jahangir takes over. And the subsequent addition has been made during the period of Aurangzeb. So at its peak, the Mughal Empire included almost the entire Indian subcontinent, intruding into crucial or strategically important areas of Afghanistan as well. So it was a massive huge and sprawling empire that the Mughals had built up over the course of almost two centuries. But this huge empire finally crumbled down under its own weight. The early Mughal rulers, Akbar, Jahangir and also Shah Jahan for that matter, were a little conscious or circumspect when it came to their Deccan policy. For Akbar and Jahangir, the ports of Gujarat were very important for economic prosperity and therefore their Deccan policy was limited basically to only ensure that in no way the Deccanese could threaten their positions over here. But subsequently during Shah Jahan and especially during Aurangzeb's times that we see that the policy starts to change. Aurangzeb as a young prince was posted as Subedar of Deccan. And from that point onwards, he had nursed this ambition of subduing the Shahis of South India and extending the Mughal dominion to the furthest possible point in the Indian peninsula. Shah Jahan was wisely counseled against this by the elder prince Dara Shikoh and he prevented Aurangzeb from annexing the Deccani Shahis. But when Aurangzeb finally came to throne, he pursued this policy to its logical conclusion as he saw it and ended the rule of Bijapur's Adil Shahi and Qutub Shahi of Golconda and annexed this entire area to the Mughal dominion. And from that point onwards, this massively stretched empire will be a very difficult kind of a you know, pursuit for the Mughals to maintain. 
Finally, in the 18th century, after the death of Aurangzeb, this entire edifice built by the Mughals will come down like a pack of cards over the next few decades. That is the story that we are going to try to understand today. The Mughals guys can be divided into two phases or periods. The first phase or period is that of the great Mughals. Okay? The period from Babur to death of Aurangzeb is basically the period of great Mughals. From 1526, when Babur comes in, all guns blazing with his artillery and subdues the Lodis and then other chiefs over here, Afghans and Rajputs as well. From that point till death of Aurangzeb in Deccan. That phase is called as the period of the great Mughals. It includes the period of Babur who had a very short span in India, barely four years after which he passed away. Succeeded by his not so competent son Humayu. Of course, he was a good ruler in his own right, but then compared to other Mughals, he was a pale shadow of them. Humayu first ruled for, from 1530 to 40, and then there is a brief interregnum where the Sur's under Sher Shah Suri are able to push him out of India, and then he again comes back and regains the throne for a brief while. Then comes the period of Akbar, who comes to the throne after Second Battle of Panipat in 1556, and Luckily for him and for Mughals, he enjoyed a long and healthy and fruitful life as the mughal -e azam the great Mughal. From 1556 to 1605, he was the emperor of India, the period during which he stitched a massive empire for the Mughals. And also, parallelly, he developed many administrative institutions, made huge contributions in the field of art, culture, architecture, so on and so forth. Okay. His son, he succeeded by his son Jahangir in 1605. Since Akbar lived quite long, you can imagine when Jahangir succeeds him, by that time Jahangir is also a very mature man in terms of age. From 1605 to 1627, Jahangir's period is there, followed by Shah Jahan from 1627 to 1656. And then finally, the last of the great Mughals is Aurangzeb. Okay? After the death of Aurangzeb, we do not see any successor who can, uh, you know, in any way match the greatness of their predecessors. Okay. Now, greatness, we don't measure, uh, you know, in one particular sense. Definitely, the Mughals had certain policies which can be criticized in the hindsight. But one thing we have to admit that they were able to stitch and maintain a huge empire, which was quite an achievement for that day and age. In that sense, they are referred to as the Great Mughals. The subsequent Mughals are known as the later Mughals. The period from 1707 till 1857 when finally the Mughal rule is ended for good, that period is called as the period of later Mughals. So our focus in this session is going to be the period of the later Mughals when the decline of Mughals is going to take place in India. Before we actually delve into that, I want to make a very quick and a very important announcement, guys. We are starting with a new prelims to interview or P2I batch for the next year's attempt, that is 2024's attempt. This is a unique opportunity for anybody who aspires to crack this exam in the next immediate attempt itself, that is of 2024. The P2I batch for 2024, September, is starting from 11th of September and is going to be a morning batch guys. This batch shall be available in English that is a combination of Hindi and English. English as well as in purely Hindi mediums. So you can select the language or medium of your choice. This batch includes all the features that one would require to give you know good shape to their preparation for civil services exam. It includes hundreds of hours of classroom teaching study material, classroom tests, weekly tests, daily lectures on current affairs, daily MCQ solving, daily answer writing practice, so on and so forth. You also have dedicated mentors who will be readily available to you at your disposal whenever you need any type of input or guidance regarding shaping your preparation for this examination. Till January, this particular batch will run in 
the foundation stage where your base for prelims and mains both will be prepared. And then from January onwards, we will shift gear and enter into the prelims preparation stage for 2024. In the prelims preparation stage, excessive focus will be on solving MCQs, developing the factual depth that is required for prelim stage and also generating that confidence of handling MCQs the way UPSC frames them. After the prelims, those students who qualify for the mains will be eligible for a mains residential program. This free residential program for the students of this batch will be available in Delhi where along with teachers, mentors and peers, you will be preparing for the main stage of this examination. Here you will be writing several hundred answers and preparing multiple themes which are you know, very likely to be asked by UPSC. This year we are already running the MRP for the upcoming mains examination which is starting shortly and the students have really loved it guys. So this is a very unique opportunity for you to avail. Those students who qualify for the interview, there are of course special programs for interview as well in this batch itself. To avail special discount on the fees, you can use my code JDLIVE. Using my code, you can get a handsome discount on the fees. You won't be paying full 70,000 and instead only about 30,000 will be paid if you use this code. Let us now get started with our discussion of decline of Mughals. The later Mughal period, we will see a series of weak, indolent and pleasure loving kings who were completely unworthy successors of the great Mughals. One after another, kings will come to the throne in quick succession and will be disposed of by nobles and by you know different other forces around them. This was the sorry state of affairs of India during the 18th century. On the screen, very briefly, we'll take an overview regarding who were these rulers and then we shall go into the detailed developments during their period. The first ruler was Bahadur Shah I, son of Aurangzeb. He succeeded him and ruled for a brief period from 1707, that is death of Aurangzeb, till 1712 where he dies. In this brief period, since Aurangzeb also ruled for a substantially long period, you can imagine Bahadur Shah was also a mature man in terms of age when he accedes to the throne and then he rules for a brief while and then passes away. Of all the later Mughals, if something positive could be said about any one of them, something can be said definitely about Bahadur Shah, we will see during his discussion. Then follows a period of quick succession of weak kings who are controlled by their nobles. Jahandar Shah, Farooq Siyar and then two kings who were brought to the throne and they died natural deaths in quick succession. Rafi ud Darajat and Rafi ud Dola. Rafi ud Darajat and Rafi ud Dola. Then comes Muhammad Shah Rangila, the infamous ruler of Delhi when Nadir Shah invaded Muhammad Shah Rangila, the most pleasure loving and indolent of them all. His days went into simply enjoying the pleasures of life, indulging in debauchery. That's Muhammad Shah Rangila as his title Rangila basically, you know, suggests. He ruled for a fairly long period considering the day and age from 1719 to 1748. But the reason being that he was a very weak ruler and he did not pose as a threat to any of the noblemen. So instead of survival of the fittest, here he believed in survival of the weakest and ensured a long stay at the throne, but definitely not a very graceful stay. He's followed by Ahmad Shah from 1748 to 54, Alamgir II from 1754 to 59, and then Shah Jahan III from 1759 to 60 briefly. And then comes Shah Alam, who is somewhat of a, uh, you know, good caliber in terms of a prince, but then already the things had gone so out of hand that uh, you know he could not do anything significant to turn things around but nevertheless he is definitely one who stands out uh, from amongst his predecessors shah alam from 1760 to ultimately 1806 then comes akbar ii from 1806 to 1837 who is a pensioner of east india company and then finally the you know tragic 
Bahadur Shah Zafar, 1837 to 1857, this fateful prince rules as the Mughal ruler and finally in 1857, he will grudgingly accept the leadership of the revolt of 1857 only to see his namesake rule also being ended, many of his sons being killed by the Britishers and he being exiled to Rangpur. So this is just a quick snapshot regarding who were the rulers. As we go into more details, guys, you will be able to appreciate their period and significant developments in a much better manner. So let us dive deeper and try to understand the period that we are discussing now that is of decline of Mughals. Now, after the death of Aurangzeb Alamgir, by the way, Alamgir was, was the title of Aurangzeb. He dies in 1707 in Deccan. He is buried in Aurangabad, the city of Aurangabad. He had three sons, Muazzam, Muhammad Azam Shah and Muhammad Kam Baksh. Three sons who will fight a war of succession at the death of Aurangzeb. Three of them were in contention to the throne. Now this was a curse, so to speak, that Mughals had. Right from the times of Jahangir, we see that there would be wars of succession to the throne. Jahangir was challenged by none other than his own son to the throne. Shah Jaha also came to power by, you know, disposing of other challenges from amongst his own siblings. Aurangzeb famously, you know, had many of his brothers killed before he could rise to the throne. And whatever had been sown during Aurangzeb's time, the same harvest was reaped at his death also. There's a famous saying in English, kingship knows no kinship. Kingship knows no kinship. Okay, That's very much applicable to this period of our history. Okay? By the way, amongst the Hindu rulers, there was this concept of Tilak. Okay? Tilak, that is, you know, the coronation or Raj Gaddi always passed on in a pre-decided manner. The ruler's eldest son automatically became the Yuvraj or the crown prince. Okay, So there was a you know, well settled rule when it came to succession amongst Hindu rulers. Whereas in case of Islam, Muslims, there is no such rule. In fact, kingship in the first place itself is not something that is sanctified by the Islamic tenets. Okay, so whenever a ruler died, there was no ordered succession. So who will succeed? The one who is considered as the most competent was rightful to succeed irrespective of whether he was the eldest or the youngest. That person may not even be a blood relative of the ruler. Okay, so we see many instances where son-in-laws came to the throne. For example, Altamash was son-in-law of the earlier ruler. In case of Nawabs of Bengal also we see that that son-in-law succeeded their father-in-laws. So in case of Muslim rule, since there was no such pre-settled kind of a system, there were often conflicts at the time of succession leading to wars. The Mughals particularly fought very brutal wars which were like uh, you know the reasons for implosion of the Mughal empire. So at the death of Aurangzeb, by the way this idea of Tilak in history is referred to as primogeniture. Okay. There's a root word here, prime and gen. Okay. Primogeniture, combining the two, primogeniture is created. Prime means first, gen means produce. Okay. So the first amongst the sons will automatically succeed. That is the idea of primogeniture. Okay. Now here, all the sons of the Mughal rulers, they all felt that they were equally competent or more competent than the other one. There was no competitive exam in that time. No prelims means an interview to find out who is the most competent. So the only way was that you fight it out. Okay. So once again, a war of succession at the death of Aurangzeb in which Prince Muazzam becomes victorious. Prince Muazzam becomes victorious after defeating his brothers. And he comes to the throne and assumes the title of Bahadur Shah the first. Okay. He took the title of Bahadur Shah the first. Now Mughal rulers often had this fashion of taking titles or in fact all rulers had this fashion of taking titles when they 
uh, you know, uh, when they took over the crown. Okay, so Alamgir, for example, was the title of Aurangzeb. Shah Jaha was the title of Prince Khurram, so on and so forth. So here his title was Bahadur Shah, Bahadur Shah the first. Okay, but historians call him, contemporary historians call him Shah e Bekhabar. Okay, for prelims, remember this fact. He is also referred to as Shah e Bekhabar. Okay, this word in Persian Urdu, Bekhabar, means a person who is heedless, who does not have the grasp of things that are going on, who does not understand what is happening. That's why he's called as Shah e Bekhabar. And who is Shah? Shah means ruler. Okay, the heedless ruler or heedless king will be the literal translation. Okay? After coming to power, Bahadur Shah tried to follow a pacific policy. Many of Aurangzeb's policies had backfired during his lifetime itself. He had meddled in the internal affairs of some of the major Rajput chiefs, leading to animosity with those Rajput houses. He had, through his religious you know, intolerance, antagonized a very big section of the Hindus. His agrarian policies were also contested by agrarian communities and consequently there was a lot of disturbance, a lot of chaos and turmoil towards the end of Aurangzeb's reign. Bahadur Shah rightly realized that some of these policies have been problematic and after coming to power, he tries to follow a pacific policy so that things could be settled down again. He showered a lot of riches on his nobles because a lot of nobles had been disgruntled during Aurangzeb's times. Aurangzeb was a very strong ruler and during his reign, nobles did not have any opportunity to assert themselves in any way. So a lot of nobles felt disgruntled at the opportunities that were being given to them by the state. But they could not stand up to the might of a person like Aurangzeb. Therefore, Bahadur Shah realizes the simmering discontent in the nobles and tries to pacify them by showering riches on them, by giving them jagirs, by giving them gifts. Okay? All of this at the cost of state finances, of course. Already the Mughal treasury had been, uh, you know, had been drained off during Aurangzeb's Deccan campaigns. Aurangzeb, for a very long time, almost two and a half decades of the last part of his life, he spent in Deccan to gain control of it. The Mughal army had been stretched beyond its limit and the exchequer was drained out of its resources because of this campaign. Yet, Bahadur Shah showers these riches on the nobles to pacify them. Although the idea was right, the discontent had to be curtailed, but then the methodology had a big effect on the state finances. Okay. Now, let us see Bahadur Shah's Maratha policy. Okay. Now, since Aurangzeb, as we just discussed, spent the last few decades of his life in Deccan to deal with the Maratha challenge, there had been a big, you know, question mark left at the death of Aurangzeb as to how the Mughals will now deal with the Marathas. Jadunath Sarkar, in his famous book on Aurangzeb, he writes that the Maratha challenge became the Spanish ulcer. It became the Spanish ulcer for Aurangzeb. Now, this is a metaphor that he draws from Europe's history. Napoleon also similarly had invaded Spain and tried to control the you know, mountainous areas of Spain where people were not happy with his invasion. And they resisted through guerrilla warfare. Napoleon's army had been tied down, a lot of resources had been spent over there and Napoleon did not achieve anything significant out of the process. Jadunath Sarkar, the famous historian, uses that same terminology to describe Aurangzeb's Deccan venture. Spanish ulcer of Aurangzeb, basically. Okay. Now, before we understand the Maratha policy, it's crucial to understand the succession-related issue amongst the Marathas. Only then we will be able to appreciate the Maratha policy in a better way. Chhatrapati Shivaji Maharaj, his glorious career finally comes to an end when he passes away a natural death in 1680. After his death in 1680, you know, after having coronated himself successfully, after having claimed that status of a sovereign equal to the Deccan Shahis or the Mughals also for that matter, after a very illustrious career, 
when he passes away finally he is succeeded by his eldest son sambhaji maharaj okay chhatrapati sambhaji maharaj ruled from 1680 to 89 in 1689 because of treachery from amongst his own people sambhaji maharaj was captured by the mughals and executed this is during aurangzeb's period itself okay. at the death of chhatrapati sambhaji maharaj along with him his family had also been captured so his young son chhatrapati shahu he was captured by the mughals and taken into their custody and he was kept in the imperial household okay while shahu was in imperial household and sambhaji maharaj had of course you know died the maratha gaddi was occupied by second son of chhatrapati shivaji maharaj raja ram maharaj from 1689 to 1700 around this time aurangzeb is still there in deccan he is trying to take a full control of the territory over here but whenever he wins a fort and goes to the next one the earlier fort is lost people in maharashtra they kept on fighting against the mughal armies so 1689 to 1700 this period the maratha ruler is raja ram maharaj but in 1700 he also passed away and after him his infant son shivaji the second shivaji the second was actually declared as the ruler while the regent queen mother tarabai was actually running the entire administration okay now shahu was in delhi and here in maharashtra shivaji the second the young son of raja ram maharaj is actually declared as the king and the regent queen mother is ruling this is the status at the death of aurangzeb theek okay? hai now bahadur shah will calibrate his maratha policy in this particular context so we have to understand this context to appreciate the maratha policy of bahadur shah first he now released the maratha prince shahu from the imperial capital he was sent back to deccan he was there in the custody of mughals as we saw right from the death of chhatrapati sambhaji maharaj so when had he died from 1789 to 1707 this period shahu was in mughal custody okay while he was being sent to deccan there was a tacit kind of an understanding that when he goes to deccan it will automatically lead to a fight between the two wings of the marathas one wing being of course shahu and the other wing being the young son uh, of raja ram maharaj shivaji the second so there will be conflict between these two sides shahu took up satara district of maharashtra satara as his base whereas the other wing of the marathas was based in kolhapur so these two branches as the mughals had uh, you know schemed they saw a civil war amongst themselves and that was the idea so bahadur shah released him but he did not recognize him as the ruler leaving the issue to be decided amongst them so that the two branches will conflict and have fight and that will make the task of mughals easier this was the idea okay he gave him sar deshmukhi but not the right of chauth so two crucial terms over here chauth and sardeshmukhi we have to understand these terms now chaut and sardeshmukhi were tribute type of taxes that chhatrapati shivaji maharaj had levied on territories surrounding the maratha kingdom chaut was one fourth of the average revenue realized and sardeshmukhi one fourth as in 25% so whatever revenue is realized in mughal domains around him or uh, you know the deccan shahis 25% of that has to be given to the maratha state else you will have to face war with the maratha state furthermore sardeshmukhi was assessed of 10% over and above this tax over and above this tribute tax of 25% this 10% exclusively went to the maratha king so these were two levies that the marathas had used right from chhatrapati shivaji maharaj's times and that is why they claimed it as their right bahadur shah when he releases shahu maharaj he gives him sar deshmukhi but does not recognize the right to chauth which marathas had traditionally 
you know levied here in uh, in the areas around their kingdom okay now all of this as expected by the mughals led to a war of succession amongst the marathas between shahu maharaj and rani tarabai of kolhapur so this is the satara branch and this is the kolhapur branch of the maratha ruling families okay i hope you got the maratha policy this will be a running theme we will we are going to see how the marathas are going to rise in the 18th century step by step this is the first important step where shahu maharaj is released from the imperial uh, you know custody okay fine now other policies of bahadur shah bahadur shah realized that aurangzeb had made grave error in interfering in internal affairs of the major rajput uh, you know ruling families okay therefore he tried to make peace with the rajput chiefs he tried to have good relations with the rajput chiefs now akbar guys was a very wise ruler and he had very consciously cultivated friendly relations with the rajput chiefs and under his reign the rajputs had become the sword arm for the mughals okay in several wars and battles of akbar it was actually the rajput chiefs who were leading the vanguard okay when the doors of kabul were opened for akbar the person leading was man singh it was the rajput chiefs who were fighting for him in the eastern part of india in bengal and towards the northeast okay during aurangzeb's times also whatever little success aurangzeb could achieve against chhatrapati shivaji maharaj that was under the leadership of a rajput chief but aurangzeb unwisely had alienated the big ruling families of marwar and mewar bahadur shah tries to reverse that okay he also tries to have peaceful relations with the bundelas jats as well as sikhs okay he granted a high mansab to guru gobind singh the sikhs had militarized khalsa panth had been created we are going to discuss all of these things evolution of the sikh uh you know sikh faith uh, in a subsequent lecture guru gobind singh had transformed the sikh community into a warrior community fighting against injustice and there were a lot of conflicts that were fought between the mughals and the sikhs under guru gobind singh during aurangzeb's times towards the end of aurangzeb's reign towards the very fag end there was some letter exchange between the two and it was hoped that there will be some patch up but aurangzeb died soon after that and then banda and bahadur shah he gave high mansab to uh, uh, guru gobind singh but unfortunately when guru gobind singh was in deccan there was an attack on him and subsequently he uh, succumbed after that particular attack and this took the mughal sikh animosity to a hitherto untouched level from that point onwards there will be very uh, you know inimical or hostile relations between the mughals and the sikhs and we are going to see that rivalry as it evolves okay when this development takes place the sikh are led by banda singh bahadur banda singh bahadur a brave sikh chief he assumes the leadership amongst the sikhs guru gobind singh had said that he is the last guru in human form and after his death the institution of guruship will end in human form it will pass into the guru granth sahib that will be the last guru so there is no guru as such in the uh, physical sense but the leadership is under the charge of banda singh bahadur who fought valiantly against against the mughals but he was defeated and the capital also back then was captured during bahadur shah's times okay bahadur shah thus was the last mughal emperor who had some level of authority some sort of control over the empire although it was a weak control and the decay had already set in but nevertheless we can at least say that bahadur shah was an emperor uh, you know suitable to be called as an emperor the rulers after him will all be controlled by their nobles they will just be puppets who are these rulers what is the succession process we will now get into that okay after he dies in 1712 mughal empire is going to see a rapid decline okay now in case you are wondering where you can get this pdf and updates about my lectures then here is the qr code that you can scan to reach my telegram channel jawad kazi upsc preparation or you may use this particular link also and follow me on telegram to get latest updates about 
the lectures that I'm posting, the notes that I'm sharing with fellow aspirants. Okay. Now, <clears throat> before I get into subsequent Mughal rulers, there are three important terms that we come across whenever we study the Mughal period, especially the medieval Indian period, especially the Mughal period. Okay. So we have to understand these three key terms. What are these three key terms? Mansabdars, Jagirdars and Zamindars. Okay. Mansabdars, Jagirdars and Zamindars. Okay. UPSC has asked question in prelim examination giving statements uh, regarding Jagirdar and Zamindar. So this is a conceptual topic related to medieval India, although not directly connected with modern part, but then unless we understand this, we will not be able to understand the declining phase of Mughals very effectively. So let us take a quick look at who were the Mansabdars, who were the Jagirdars and who were the Zamindars. So let us first start with Mansabdari system. What was the Mansabdari system? The word Mansab. It's a Persian word basically. It means a seat, a position or a rank. Okay? As a root word, it means a seat, position or a, a rank. Dar, again a Perso-Arabic word which means holder of. So mansab plus dar. So mansab dar together it means a person who holds a mansab, who holds a rank or position. Such a person is called as mansab dar. Similarly, Zamindar, okay, Jagirdar, who's a Jagirdar? A person who holds a Jagir. Inamdar, a person who holds some Inam, okay. Hawaldar, okay, a post that we have in Indian Army also, we have in our police systems as well. Hawaldar, a person who has some Hawala, some responsibility, that is Hawaldar, okay. So, in this manner, this suffix Dar is used for holder. In simple terms, it would be like Wala. Like these days we call somebody as Dilli Wala, means somebody of Delhi. So in similar way, in medieval times we had this Dar. I hope you got this. So Mansab is a ranking system of Mughal officials. You can say it is like a carder of officials. Carder. Just like IAS, Indian Administrative Service, is a carder of officers of the government of India. These officers are then posted to different duties and responsibilities. They may be sent to revenue. They may be sent to some uh, you know, public sector enterprise. They may be sent to some independent body. They may be sent to some foreign deputation. So basically, it's a cadre of officers who is then assigned to different administrative duties. So on similar lines, Mansabdar is a cadre of Mughal officials who will occupy all important positions of Mughal system, Mughal governance system, except judiciary. Except judiciary, these Mansabdars could be posted to various different types of responsibilities. I hope you got it thus far, guys. Now, who developed this system? It was developed under Akbar. The Mansabdari system was developed under Akbar. Akbar knew that it is not sufficient to be brave and win wars. You have to develop very efficient systems of governance systems to exploit revenue systems to provide administration and justice and for that akbar designed meticulously a bureaucracy the base of which was this mansabdari system these mansabdars could be given political administrative as well as economic responsibilities okay different types of roles and responsibilities could be given to them they had a significant role in consolidation of the empire for an empire to function effectively, it requires the best talent available to be deployed for administration. Mansabdari system gave Akbar and Mughals that system to attract the best talent, give them the best opportunities, give them rewards, give them recognition, give them growth so that they will contribute their talent towards the furthering of the Mughal rule. So this was a very effective kind of a system designed by Akbar. They could be deployed in all departments except judiciary. Now, judiciary during Mughal times was dealt with by ulema. So they had their own, you know, separate system of recruitment. Whereas in other departments, the mansabdars could be posted. 
Abul Fazal says that there were six, 66 grades of mansabdars. Okay. So it is not just one single carder, it is also carder that is graded based on positions, based on your relative importance in the entire system of governance. So there were as many as 66 grades according to Abul Fazal's Ain Akbari. Okay. These grades were based on ranks of 10 horsemen, that is a mansabdar of 10 horsemen to that of 10,000 horsemen. Later on, we also come across details of 33 grades amongst these. Although Abul Fazal has mentioned 66 were there, but we have details of 33 grades of mansabdars. Okay. So long story short, mansabdari system is a system of governance designed by Akbar to attract the best talent for the service of the empire. This is a cadre of officers that can be posted to any department. It is ranked or graded based on their importance in the system. This ranking is done on the basis of number of troops under their command. There is a gradation of 66 levels according to Abul Fazal. Okay. 33 we actually uh, you know come across in different records. Okay. Now what did the Mansabdari or Mansabdar rank tell us about? It told us about three important things. Number one, what was the status of the holder? That Mansabdar, what was his status? We come to know that. Second, we come to know the pay of the holder. And number three, we come to know the obligation that that Mansabdar had regarding maintaining of troops and equipments. So a Mansabdari rank tells us three things. Number one is status, number two is pay and number three is the specific number of troops that that Mansabdar is supposed to you know maintain with him. So if a Mansabdar has a certain rank, say he is a Paj Hazari Mansabdar for example, okay, topmost rank. So he, he will be expected to maintain 5000 troops under his command. We come to know his status. In the hierarchy, 5000 rank Mansabdar means one of the highest ranking Mansabdar from amongst the royal family, most likely it will be one. Second, based on that, we can understand the kind of pay that person will derive to. And number three, we come to know the number of troops that that person will be expected to maintain. These are the three things that we come to know. The Mansabdari system has two ranks Zat rank and Savar rank. Zat and Savar. Okay. Earlier it used to be just one single rank, but later on Akbar himself changed this and we have Zat and Savar, two different ranks that a Mansabdar has. Okay. So for example, if there is a Mansabdar, Mr. X, his rank will be expressed in Mansabdari system as say 2000, 2000. Okay. Where the first 2000 represents his Zat rank, and second 2000 represents his Savar rank. So two ranks were included in this manner. The Zat rank denoted the personal rank, the personal status of that Mansabdar. And the Savar rank denoted the troop obligation that he was supposed to maintain. So this rank told us about his position, his personal position in the hierarchy of the Mansabdars. Where does he fit in? Very much like we have, you know, grade pay system in our administration. When you want to identify across different, you know, services across different streams, which officer is at which level, you ask them what is the grade pay. So grade pay like system over here is Zat. Please note here the word Zat is not about caste as such. Okay. Here Zat means person. Okay. Personal. That is what is meant over here. Like in Urdu, they say, this is something that belongs to me personally. That is the meaning of Zat over here. So that's his personal status or rank. And second is Savar. Now what is meant by Savar? Back then, Mughal army was largely composed of cavalry. I mean the largest number of troops were cavalry troops. Yes, there was artillery, but then a very small number of troops were required for that relatively. And infantry was also there, but it was not that significant. Uh, as compared to later times during modern times. 
So Mughal armies were largely, you know, horseback uh, warrior army. So that's why Sawar, the number of horsemen that that Mansardar maintained was very crucial. Okay. So there were further three classes of Mansardars. I hope you understood the Zat rank and the Sawar rank. Now, based on this, there were further three classes of Mansardars. First class was where Zat and Sawar rank were equal, like this case, 2000, 2000. Zat rank 2000, Sawar rank 2000. Second was where Sawar was half or more than half of the Zat. Okay? So 2000 is his Zat rank and Sawar rank is say 1500 or more. That is one category. Okay? And then third is Sawar rank is less than half of the Zat. So Sawar rank is say 1000, less than half of the Zat rank. These would be the three categories. Now why such categorization was required? See the Mughal state was paying this Mansabdar for two different things. One was his personal salary based on his Zat rank where he stood in the Mughal administrative system, he is paid accordingly. Furthermore, he is also paid for salary of his troops. Okay? Now, these troops needed to be maintained for war-related purposes. But all Mansabdars were not, you know, as we saw, uh, you know, fighters or warriors. There would be some people who are employed in other different streams also. And they would not need these many horsemen or troops under them. So for that reason, there was always flexibility. Okay? The number of Savars to be maintained could be lower than the Zat rank. And hence, this threefold classification also existed. Okay, I hope you got this. Mansabdar's personal position was determined based on Zat. Okay. Personally, how big a fellow he is, how important a chap he is in the administration, that we come to know from this rank only, from the Zat rank, not from the Savar rank. Savar is incidental. Okay? This rank tells us his position, his importance in the governance system as such. Okay? During crisis situations, it was allowed to increase the Savar ranks without increasing the Zat rank. Okay? Now, generally, it will be at the same level or less. But sometimes it may so happen that this Mansabdar is posted in a frontier area. There were always clashes in the northwest frontier with the Afghan Pathan tribes. Okay? If suppose a Mansabdar like Amir Khan, famous Mansabdar back then, Akbar times, he is posted over there to fight with the Afridi tribes in Khyber Pass area. So he needs more troops. But if we increase the troops and parallelly Zat rank also increases, then what will happen? It will upset the balance in administration. It will increase the burden on the state. So, a solution was found out to this during Jahangir's times. Keeping the Zat rank same, that is at 2000, his Savar ranks could be increased. Okay, so this could be made 4000 or 6000 also. So, state will pay him excess for the troops maintained, but his personal salary will remain the same. This system was called as Do Aspa, Si Aspa during Jahangir's times. So remember this term, Do Aspa, Si Aspa. Do and Si means two and three. Jahangir's reform. Okay? Jahangir allowed this flexibility so that without increasing the status of the Mansabdar, without increasing the salary burden for his personal expenses, the number of troops could be increased under him. Okay? So I hope you got this you know, concept or system. Now, how were the Mansabdars recruited? Okay. Mansabdars were recruited on the recommendation of this officer, Mir Bakshi. Remember the term, Mir Bakshi? He was the head of the military department of the Mughals. He presented the candidates before the emperor, generally speaking. This was the routine thing or the norm. But often, top nobles and provincial governors also recommended some candidates to the Mughal emperor and their recommendations could also be accepted. When a Mansabdar was inducted into the system, then an official Farman was issued. Just like we have gazetted officers, when, a, when an aspirant like you is selected for a gazetted post, then the name of that aspirant is published in the Gazette of India. So similarly here, a special Farman with official seal was issued 
to communicate that this person has been inducted into the Mansabdari system with so and so rank. Okay. Promotion procedure was also the same. Recommendations came from Mir Bakshi. Since primarily all of these Mansabdars were in some way or the other serving in army. Yes, they could also be serving in other departments, but primarily it was a fighting kind of a job. So Mir Bakshi was responsible for all of these purposes. So he is like the head of the HR department also, who is doing an appraisal and recommending promotion to the Mughal emperor based on performance. During Akbar's times, we see that 1803 Mansabdars existed, whereas towards the end of Aurangzeb's reign, we see 14,499, almost 14,500 Mansabdars were there in the Mughal system. So you can see such a huge jump from Akbar to Aurangzeb's time. And this also became a major reason for the economic crisis during Aurangzeb's times, the increasing burden of Mansabdars, especially those who had Jagirs. Okay. Now, who were allowed or who were, you know, considered fit or worthy of becoming Mansabdars? Okay. Now, technically speaking, Mansabdari system was open to anybody with talent or merit. This was to be a system based on talent. And to the credit of Akbar, we can definitely say that he was a man who understood the value or worth of merit and talent. But these are medieval times. Okay, You don't have independent bodies to conduct examinations to find out who is the most talented. Okay, Practically speaking, hereditary became, hereditary factors were the most important. Okay? Khan Azads or Khan Zads, remember the term, important term from medieval times. Khan Zads who were descendants of Mansabdars themselves, they had the first claim on Mansabdar positions. So, it was very much about pedigree, number one. Very often, Zamidars were also recruited as Mansabdars. Please understand this. Zamidars, the concept or term is different from Mansabdars. We are coming to that term shortly. Zamidars were often also recruited as Mansabdars. If you see racially, Turanis, Iranis. Turanis are Central Asians, by the way. Okay. Mughals themselves being originally from Central Asia. Turanis were the most dominant element in the Mansabdari system. Followed by Iranis, Afghans, Indian Muslims, Rajputs, and later during Aurangzeb's times, even Marathas and other Deccanis. Deccanis from Bijapur and Golconda. They were also inducted as Mansabdars. Okay. Those who held high position in other kingdoms. Sometimes it so happened that another kingdom is annexed. Or somebody was there in another kingdom, but he has switched side. So such people were also inducted. Okay, the Ayarams and Gayarams of that day. So they were also inducted as Mansabdars in the Mughal system. Okay. Rulers of autonomous principalities. A lot of these Rajput chiefs, for all practical purposes, they had internal autonomy. They just had to give a peshkash annually to the Mughal ruler and they could rule over their domain practically independently. They were also inducted as you know, high-ranking Mansabdars in the Mughal system. Okay? Promotions in Mansabdari were based on loyalty to the crown and performance in the battlefields or otherwise, as well as the kind of heredity or lineage that that person could boast of. Based on this, the Mansabdars could make a good career for themselves. Okay? Now, how was this system actually run? Mir Bakshi, as we noted, was the person in charge. The chief of the military department was in charge of efficient functioning of this system. The Mir Bakshi used to regularly inspect and physically verify the number of troops. Now, see, back in those days, transport and communication is not easy. Okay? Mansabdars will be posted across you know, different nooks and corners of the empire. So, how do we verify whether he is maintaining his mandated quota of troops. So say 2000 is his Zat rank and 2000 is his Savar rank. He is deriving salary based on this. But whether he is maintaining 2000 troops or no, that has to be checked. Okay. So for this, regular inspections were done by Mir Bakshi. System of Daago Chehra was used. What is meant by Daago Chehra? Since it was all about horsemen, Savar, Therefore, horses were branded. Okay? There was a stamp, you know, hot iron was imprinted on the skin of the horse. 
so it left a permanent mark over there that was the dog that told the verifying authority that yes this horse is the one that was reported earlier also so dag was used and chehra chehra was the description of the face of the troop the horseman okay so in those days of course there was no there were no photographs and it was not possible to paint every single person's portrait so instead a record was maintained about how the person appeared this system was called as dag or chehra okay this was a procedure that was used for inspection by the mughals to ensure that the requisite number of troops are always maintained otherwise what will happen people will take salary of 2000 troops but they'll have only 1000 troops okay and they will you know siphon off salary of 1000 troops to their personal account so this should not happen now this payment of personal salary as well as sawar salary this could be done in two forms one was in cash form and such payments were called as nakdi or cash based payments and second was in jagir form so these were non cash payments okay so mansabdar could be paid in two forms either in nakdi form or in jagir form these were the two different types of forms that were used back then okay salary for sawar rank how much salary he got for sawar rank total salary for each trooper okay so there was a fixed salary for every single troop and suppose he is about supposed to maintain 2000 troops then multiply that salary of one troop with 2000 and you get the sawar salary of that particular mansabdar okay system of escheat or zapt whenever a mansabdar died okay at his death all his property was first confiscated by the emperor and then all his previous accounts were settled if he owed anything to the state all of that was recovered first and in case anything survived after that or anything remained after that then the surplus was given to the family so becoming a mansabdar you had to always have this risk of zapt escheat okay the idea was the state had given a lot to the mansabdar so now the state had the right to ensure that he is not passing on any ill gotten gains to the next generation so immediately all his property is uh, you know uh, is confiscated first is cheated first and then after that only when the accounts are tallied settled then the surplus is passed on to the uh, uh, the survivors of that particular mansabdar so this is how control was mentioned uh, was maintained over the mansabdars during this period now we'll see what was the jagirdari system then okay now some of the mansabdars were paid in the form of jagirs as we noted instead of cash payment so instead of state paying out of the revenue that it has received the state told the mansabdar that okay we will assign you a particular territory you go over there collect the revenue from there keep for yourself whatever is due to you in terms of salary personal salary as well as troop salary and the remaining amount you give back to the state so this system is called as jagir system jagir system was a land revenue assignment transferable land revenue assignment that was given to mansabdar remember not all mansabdars were jagirdars okay some mansabdars were nakdi mansabdars who were paid in cash and some were paid in the form of jagir they are called as jagir dars okay so these jagir dars collected revenue in that area and in place of cash salary from the revenue they will keep their salary and remaining amount they will give to the state now how will we verify whether they are actually doing it honestly or no so for that purpose state used to estimate the revenue that will be realized from the jagir okay so before a mansabdar is given a jagir the state has already done a revenue estimate of it which is called as jama okay remember another important term jama what is jama jama is the estimated revenue of that jagir what is the amount that can come as revenue from that jagir that is called as jama okay and this jama was estimated in dams dams okay what were dams dams were small copper coins during medieval times 
द सेम वर्ड दैट वी यूज इन हिंदी इवन टू दिस डेट क्या दाम में मिला है ठीक है सो दैट दाम इज बेसिकली कॉपर कॉइन ऑफ दैट डे एंड एज दैट वॉज यूज ड्यूरिंग मुगल पीरियड सो टूगेदर इट इज कॉल्ड एज जामा दामी वॉट इज जामा दामी इट इज द एस्टिमेटेड रेवेन्यू ऑफ अ पर्टिक्यूलर एरिया एक्सप्रेस इन दाम दैट इज जामा दामी ओके सो स्टेट नोज वॉट इज द जामा दामी ऑफ अ जागीर इट नोज वॉट इज द सैलरी ऑफ द जागीरदार ऑफ कोर्स नाउ बेस्ड ऑन दैट इट कैन ऑलवेज कैलकुलेट एज टू हाउ मच द जागीरदार इज सपोज टू पे टू द स्टेट एज सरप्लस दिस इज हाउ द सिस्टम वर्क ओके now one important thing that we must remember is that all the jagirdars there are some exceptions we'll see that later but generally the norm is the mansabdars who have been paid in the form of jagirs their jagirs are always transferable so a jagirdar who is given a jagir in a particular area he will be there for a few years and then after that he can be transferred to some another area this is done to maintain control on the jagirdar so that he does not develop the local roots and challenges the state itself so they are kept constantly churning this is the idea while this was good for the sake of control it had a negative effect also since the jagirdar knew that he will not be there in a area for a very long time he was not very interested in investing in that jagir for long term benefits he knew he was there only for a few years and he only wanted to rack rent and get the maximum that he can out of that jagir this led to increased burden on the peasants this is how the jagir system or jagirdari system of mughals worked guys in my next lecture i will tell you about zamindari system and how it is different from the concepts that we have already discussed and then we will go into the subsequent mughal rulers guys of the later mughal period i hope you found this session useful and interesting if you want this series to continue then do smash that like button and leave a comment with some love in there for me so that you know i find the motivation to continue this series from strength to strength 